Dr. Funnel. Dr. Yes, Dr. Yes. Yeah. 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 So it's a rhythm why do you against, say that? Rhythm again. Rhythm against the rhythm. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. We're playing one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Here my eight notes. I'm grouping them in sixes. Rhythmic ideas that run against the grain for a long time create tension too. And if we start them and end them at the perfect spot, it's tremendously satisfying. We come back <laughs> at the top of that blues chorus and boom! <laughs> drop a crater in the ground like that. <laughs> and, and, and oh thank goodness he finished that thing. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's sometimes it's like oh, it's a, the pain the pain just ended, you know. But that's what we do as musicians. We we inflict a little bit of hurt on people in addition to the in, in addition to the pleasure, right? Just a little. Yeah, so let's do it again and now that we talked about it a little bit, you'll hear those three beat phrases and see if you can tell that that's eighth notes that I'm playing. And uh, and see if you can follow along in the form, in the blues, the 12-bar blues form. I'm going to do it for a whole chorus, second chorus we play. I'm going to launch into this thing a little quicker this time, so I don't have to be in that no man's land of whether the eighth notes are smaller or right. One, two, one, two, three. <laughs> Yeah, six notes sticking, isn't it? 
Yeah, so drummers apply rudiments, which are little micro scales on the drums, and we plug those things in, and a paradiddle diddle happens to be a six note idea. So when we have those already in our hands, it's really easy to use that kind of thing. Then I would go to longer and longer things, map out longer cycles. And I happen to know that in a 12 bar blues, it's going to come out fine at the top of the form because it's a multiple of three bars. Three beat phrases will repeat every three bars. One, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, comes out perfectly. But it helps to have that information in advance, or else you kind of have a heart attack when you're launching into the idea. Yes. <laughs> so it's so what practice is for. You know, we get used to these ideas and we work them through. And I use a lot of play along tracks to test myself on these things. So I have things like, uh, you know, bass lines and different rhythm section play along tracks. And I also use a metronome that way to make sure that I can hang with these ideas and I don't have to. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to get lost. Anytime we use any kinds of ideas like this, the real challenge is to play the idea, this tricky thing, but we don't want to go into a tunnel to do it. And if you feel like when you're executing that musical idea it's really challenging, you sort of suddenly block everything else out around you, you get very myopic, you go into, a, into this dark tunnel of focus on the skill that you have. That's an indication that you don't really have that skill well enough developed in order to play it really musically. We need to do what I call shrinking down that task. If, if I'm playing an idea that requires all my attention to the expense of listening to the band and knowing where I am in the form and evaluating my dynamics and evaluating whether this is actually a tasteful thing to be doing right now, then I shouldn't be doing it. I need to be able to listen, I need to be able to play heads up, eyes open, and hear what I'm doing. And in a sense, it's sort of, you kind of have to have a, an out-of-body experience a little bit, kind of get above the band and go, okay, is this working? You know, just like I'm listening to somebody else. That's really, great musicians can really do that. They can really evaluate the sound of what they're playing with the rest of the band. And as we're learning these things, we tend to go inward, and all we hear is what we're doing, and then we hope that we come out of that tunnel, and Dom and I meet up, and we have some clue where we are together. Hope I? Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> but ideally, we're connected the whole time. We're not even in a tunnel. We're just, just we're out and open. We can hear each other. We can see each other. And I can tell, you know, if, if something's happening, I can make little adjustments. Because... Uh, Unfortunately, when most of us are young and we're taking music lessons, maybe we have piano lessons and we're playing a duet with our teacher, we're often said, don't listen to me, just count and play your part. Just, just keep good time and pra practice with the metronome. And if you execute your part, we'll both meet, sort of like blindly mapping something out and hoping that we meet over here. Well, wouldn't it be easier, instead of blindly mapping it out, if we could actually see each other and adjust like, like we move around the world, like, like good athletes work together. Maybe they watch each other, they can see, they have a sense of each other. And so that's a real challenge. You know, there are these different phases of getting these kinds of ideas together. And at first, we're all excited about it, and we go into this tunnel, and then we can become very unmusical. And we can come out and we go, what the hell, man? I thought, I, where are you? I, this is, oh, this is disappointing. <laughs> you know? That's okay, that's part of the process. I mean, we, you know, let's, let's face it, we all have to stink the place up really badly a lot of times before it starts getting better. You know? So don't be afraid to try stuff and don't be afraid to, to mess up, but know that the goal is to be able to hear what's happening and be aware. And maybe I decide to stop the idea partway through. Maybe I decide, oh, I'm playing a little too loud, or oh, they're going someplace else, or the other player's getting me kind of a dirty look, and I'm thinking, hey, really digging this, I mean, maybe I'll bail. You know? And so we want to be able to keep our sensors on all the time. That's a general, general musical idea that you know, takes a long time to learn, and then we do, we do get led down the wrong path sometimes in, in the idea of, don't listen to your neighbor, just 
just focus. Well, that can help for a minute, but when we're playing jazz, we need to be flexible. We need to be connected. And actually something I do with my students sometimes is when we're learning polyrhythms and other cross rhythms, sometimes I will say, okay, you play with me. I'm going to speed up and slow down a little bit. You need to be able to play this thing, and we need to be able to flex, okay? Let's try it. Who knows how to play a two against three polyrhythm? That's three against four. You get double credit. And you said three against three? I said, yeah, two against three. Just think about parallel bells. What do I mean? Does everybody know what I mean by two against three polyrhythm? Okay. Who said no? That's the first one. Okay. So, in its simplest form, a polyrhythm is simply two speeds of, of notes going at the same time. And, we, and, and the way we describe it is about the speed of those notes, how many we can fit in a given amount of time. So, two against three means we have a match here. And between the matches, including the match, we have one hand doing two notes, and then the other hand does three in the same amount of time. So we have one, two, three, 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 one, two, 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 one, two,
example it's that I really want you to, to work on that. It's, it's pretty simple, but it's a little harder than it seems at first, you know. And if you can hear that, there are a lot of rhythms that will no longer be threatening to you. You'll hear kind of the key behind a lot of rhythms that are going on. Here's another one It's a little trickier, but it's a three against four. And adults of all 
ages, they're very capable of learning all different kinds of tunes, and especially if you're willing to struggle with it a little bit and, and kind of put aside any embarrassment about how hard the coordination is to try to play both those parts at the same time. You can teach polyrhythms through songs, like Care of the Bells, and kids play that all the time at that age, right? I wouldn't probably get into this, okay, let's play dolphin dance, and I'm going to play <laughs> cross with them thing, and here we are, so we're, you know, and here we are in the form, you know, so I think the central concept of that absolutely can be presented and taught to kids of, of any age, and, and, uh, and musicians of all levels. And in jazz, we, you know, we get a little bit more under the hood about how we apply these things. And the nice thing is that if you understand how those two polyrhythms, the two against three and the three against four, sound, then you're on to a lot of what you might hear in many, many different kinds of recordings. And things that are really uh, tricky sounding will kind of unveil themselves to you a little bit. You know, If you understand about dividing, subdividing, and thinking about, well, what's the rhythmic subdivision kind of organizes these things. Do I hear any groupings going on? I hear some sort of rub. I hear some tension. What's going on? And uh, if you're willing to explore those things, you can really learn a lot about rhythm and you can enjoy hearing those ideas and you can start trying them in your playing. You know? uh, a lot of jazz musicians are interested in metric modulation. Who knows what metric modulation is? Five, six, six, four. Well, two. those are different time signatures, yeah. but metric modulation is a little bit different from that. That's Metric modulation is maybe where we're playing a tune, and suddenly it sounds like we go into a different time signature, we play a different speed, but it's often what we call implied time. Um, it's, it's sort of superimposed on the main time. And um, jazz musicians love playing around with that stuff. A lot of great jazz recordings have those have those ideas embedded in them. And, you know, these all go back to the same kind of concepts of understanding, well, um, if I understand a three against two polyrhythm, let's try something here. Let's, let's go back to that walking line. Sorry, right? Sorry Dom. No, yeah, well, we can play the same thing over and over. No, great. Okay, so and I'm going to try to do a little metric modulation, just as an example, based on that three against two polyrhythm. So when we start walking, when I talk about three against two polyrhythm, the slow side of the polyrhythm in this example is going to be the quarter note. It's going to be what Dom is walking. And I'm going to go faster. I'm going to, go, I'm going to play three over that. And I'll start playing that kind of embedded in the regular time. And then I might commit to it a bit more and see, see what it sounds like.
and, and I never went back. <laughs> so you didn't leave any breadcrumbs, so you could nope. say, oh, nothing like that. Okay. Yeah. All right. No. <laughs> you, we found, you found exactly where, where your cutoff is on that yeah. comfort level. So yeah. we're pushing. Push it. Okay. You know, if, you know, you're playing six six beats per bar, and you start getting lost. Hang in there, man. Try it again. Get it. You know, play it with a recording. Just put on, put on a familiar recording with a nice 12-bar blues on it, and start playing against that thing. And just hear hear that tension, and start to learn to hear that tune. You, it's kind of like you hear it a bit sideways, you know. Yeah. And so you can put on Freddie Freeloader if you want. Okay. You know. Ba -ba Right? Yeah. And and if, if you're smart, learn to sing it while you're playing that line on it, because that's an indication that you can be eyes open, ears open, head up. And really listen to what's happening when you're doing that kind of maneuver. Okay. It's simple, but see, you're unlucky. Yeah. Because I play drums, I don't have to make the changes. Yeah. I don't have to worry about, oh man, I'm playing all these shapes. I know I'm playing four bars on the one, yeah. and, and, and you know, and, and then I'm going to the four. And when you go to the four, well now how many notes do you have to play? Yeah. And and have mercy on you when you start doing it. You know modulations that are five over four and stuff like that. Yeah. So why well, did you realize? Tell them. <laughs> See, he's, he's got the hard job. So when you're making the changes, you know, that's what I'm talking about. Though. It's called the harmonic rhythm, right? The rate at which the chords change in a song, and you can play around and you can divide it up uh, in different ways. But uh, generally, the way we do metric modulations, the harmonic rhythm stays the same, right? So we might go into this thing that feels a lot faster. But it doesn't mean that 16 quarter notes later you're on the four chord. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you got to do a lot more math, and that's a lot trickier. And uh, if you want to, you know, the, the great rhythm section that, that played most of the guys who played on Dolphin Dance, the tune you guys played, Tony Williams and, and, and Ron Carter and Herbie Hancock, they, you know, they were some of the big pioneers on a lot of this stuff. Right. And if you listen to a record called Miles Smiles, and uh, the, the way they play footprints on there right. is is one of my first uh, introductions to them monkeying around with that time like that, you know, and, and really taking a taking a, a, a number of measures, you know, like six beats, and just saying we could we could do eight in there, we could kick down and do only four in there, and they're messing around all the time and being very playful with the time in there, very natural and and communicative way. And you know, they don't play those ideas all that accurately at first, you know. Right. But they listen to each other and they adjust. Those guys never go into that dark tunnel. They never they never lose sight of each other. They listen and adjust. Questions? This kind of spurs the improviser too to get out of boxes, you know, yeah, like four bar yeah. phrases or eight bar phrases and go yeah. past that right. and start somewhere new and those kind of things. Yeah, because sometimes we get a little bit, a little bit stuck in, in, in certain kinds of phrases and certain lengths of phrases and it's hard to find a way out. Sometimes the rhythm section can, can provide a little different current and it's refreshing and you can kind of jump into that. Now at the same time, we don't want to force these ideas uh, on people if they're, not, if they're not going to be helpful. You know, the improviser as great Benny Green schooled me on one time, the customer is always right. <laughs> the improviser, the vocalist, there's always somebody who has the floor. And you need to respect that person's position and serve that person. Yes, it's a, there's a give and take, but it's very important to not get so into our own thing that we're running right over the person who's supposed to be creating a beautiful solo or delivering a song. Yeah. So uh, you're saying like this dark tunnel, like if, if you go into this tunnel then you're not, uh, you haven't become skilled enough to use that, um, you know, yes. practice in the, in the song. So with that being said, say you do get out of that tunnel, you uh, practice a lot and are able to do things like this, and then you're playing with people not um, as skilled or it, uh, as, um, 
like no one's seeing that porn. Uh, does, does, that, does that mean, oh, don't play that? Or does that mean like try and work them through it? That's a fantastic yeah. question. Um, mm. Always the, the overriding guideline needs to be what works right now with these people I'm playing with. Mm. This is about us working together and identifying our common likes, our common abilities, and making the best of that. So at no time do we want to sacrifice that concept for a self-interested little exploration that we're doing. Now we're going to stretch each other a little bit. We're going to, you know, we're going to push each other a little bit. And in rehearsal, maybe we can, you know, maybe maybe I'll ask, come on, man, you got you guys can hang with this. Let's work this. You know, you want to learn this? Let's let's take some time to work on this. But if you know, in a performance, uh, I want to listen well enough to the players that I'm playing with that I have a sense of whether that will work. And and. And I'm lucky enough to play with a lot of people uh, who I've played with for a long time. And as we get to know each other musically, we get a sense of what works. You know, it's a relationship, right? And th th that's what counts. So always, you know, my thing as a drummer, I'm always, my goal is to try to make it easy for everybody else to do their thing, make it feel good, and find that overlap. You know, we're all very different as human beings, and we're all very different as musicians. But if we think of coming to a group and each of us has something we lay down, our interest, this shape of our interest and this, this color, and we all lay it down in the center of a, of a circle, there are going to be parts of my pattern that are, don't overlap with anybody. And there might be parts that overlap with Dom's pattern, and there might be other parts, you know, you might have some stuff that's out there that doesn't overlap at all with me. What I'm interested in is where do we all overlap? Where, how, how can we make this thing work with all of us? Bands tend to focus on our differences and incompatibilities. And it doesn't help us a lot to focus on that because sometimes those we can stretch and we can practice and we can learn, but we can't really make those parts that don't overlap actually overlap right now. But if we put our energy into where, the, where we overlap, we can usually make a whole lot of music. Yeah. That, might mean, that might mean that I can't play this thing that's back here <laughs> you know, in my own, my own thing. You know, I might yearn for a group where, man, I want to play with some people who, can, who want to do that too, but that's not this right now. Mm -hmm. So that's an excellent question, and that is really the overriding concern, I think, and the overriding principle of playing well with people is looking for the overlap and sensing whether it works or not and talking. You know, how did that work for you when I did that double time thing in, in your dolphin dance solo? Did that bug you or was that cool? Joe and I have been playing together, Dr. Gilman and I have been playing together for, for many, many years and there have been plenty of times when he's come to me and said, don't do that thing in there. <laughs> <laughs> Stop doing the filling that when I'm working on my herpes stuff. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> right, you know, and we communicate. We communicate, and we learn. We learn the language. And I said, I'm sorry. I, I, I wasn't even aware of how wrong that was for you, and how that didn't fit. You know. And I'll, I'll say the same thing to other people. Do you hear what I'm doing? What are you doing? Bass player, do you hear? I'm playing in two. What are you doing walking? Okay, well, that's why we communicate. You know, Hopefully we don't take it too personal. We don't get too offended. We improve each other by communicating in the spirit of, of making the music better. I work with a lot of vocalists, and sometimes vocalists like to back phrase. They like to sing the line behind the band. And... Okay, so I'm playing along, and I know the customer's always right, right? And I'm supporting the vocals, man. You know, but if the singer is back phrasing, I don't want to jump back with him or her because I'm going to deprive them of the space they're trying to create. Okay, so let's say you and I go for a hike, and we're walking along together, and then after a while I say, well, you know, I'm going to drop back. I just want to kind of let my mind run. We're going to, you know, 
I drop back a few hundred yards, and you might instinctively want to drop back and wait for me. And that, that's conscientious, but I might say, no, it's, it's all right, I'm fine, I'm not having a heart attack or anything. I just want to walk by myself for a while. And so if you keep dropping back, you're kind of depriving me the space that I want, you know. And in music, sometimes we need to recognize, oh, this person wants a little bit of space. And other times I might interpret it that, like, man, he'd probably really dig it if I jumped right in there with that thing. That would be validating the idea that he's throwing out, and we'll go, and that'll be fun. And then maybe we'll talk about it afterwards. Or maybe we'll just try it differently next time. So there's, there's no set answer to that. Uh, you know, if I'm playing, if the music feels really good and, and somebody's soloing and they want to kind of go sideways, maybe I'll just let them go and we'll hear that. You know, if I take away the rhythm I'm playing and somebody's doing something polyrhythmic, if I go with them, there's no polyrhythm anymore, <laughs> right? You know, so I just took away an important part of the, the thing. So there are a lot of things to think about and we just try different things and see what, what sounds the best. Can I ask a question as far as this? This is very basic, but how do you approach teaching your students at, at, the, at the various levels that you're teaching? Uh, the metronome, the $10 metronome. How do uh, I approach metronome. teaching them? To what is a metronome, metronome to you? Uh, the, the machine, the metronome. How do you, how do you approach this? Uh, well, that's one of the things percentage. I was thinking about covering today, but I, I, Diane, how many, it's 412. What time am I supposed to be done? 420. Okay. Roughly so. Yeah. Okay. I think it's great to practice with the metronome, and I'll be as concise about this as possible. And it's hard for me because I've spent so much time wrestling with how to practice with the metronome and how to improve my time. Um, I've worked very hard at improving my time, and I feel like I still have a long way to go. I still feel like I'm working on it, and it's not always where I want it to be. But using a metronome creatively is a great way to improve your time. I think the, mo the most basic thing, especially for younger kids, is everything you practice, you should be able to play with a metronome. And if you're comfortable with one tempo, Slow it down 10 beats a minute and see if you can play it at that tempo. We always are taught that we have to go slow before we go fast. That's correct. But we get into a habit of always working things up. We're always on the way to going faster. Sometimes we need to spend some time being on the way to going slower. Because slow tempos are a lot harder than fast tempos. Right? And I know me personally, I'm much more likely to speed up than to slow down. So I work a lot harder at finding a comfortable tempo, and I say, okay, minus 20. I'm gonna slow that thing down, see if I can hang, and oh my goodness, I'm no, so much less comfortable, and I gotta, I gotta make friends with this tempo now, and learn all the tensions involved. I'll give you two ideas that will help your more advanced students and help you guys as you work on metronome. So, when we start playing with the metronome, we usually play with something like this. Sorry about that. Is that a good point? Yeah, that's fine. So, you practice your piece like this, and you're getting good with it, right? Okay, I'm going to make you walk some more. It doesn't have to be blue, though. Oh, you do.
how about some? I had to go real quick here. I had a, a very, a very difficult personal journey working on my time where I, I realized, oh man, I came to this spot where I realized when I was about 18 or 19, mercy, I got to work on my time. I, my time is terrible. I got to work on my time. So what do you do when you work on your time? You work with a metronome, and at that time, drum machines were were brand new, and and so I. I Worked with drum machine a lot, and I think worked so hard that I could actually hang and play along and, and stay with it and play whole tunes with the drum machine. I was all excited. And then this crushing realization came to me that great, I learned how to play along, and I've surgically removed my spine in the process. You know, I'm, in other words, I'm following and I'm, I'm, I'm not owning the time anymore. I'm, I'm chasing this thing, and I've gotten good at chasing it, and, and, and I would sound really passive, and there's no conviction in my playing. And so then the bigger challenge unveils itself to me. And that's like, I need to own the time still. I not only need to play better time, but I need to own it. I need to generate this time from within. I can't use this little device as my boss. And that's where using it more sparsely happens. And that's where turning it off and generating the time for yourself and feeling the time really comes into play. So be careful when you're using metronome because you can learn to follow really well, but especially for drummers and really for every musician, we really need to own the time and we need to feel it. We don't call it a feel for nothing. We use our body to feel the time. And when I can feel the time, trust me, your body is a much better friend, a much more honest friend to you when it comes to time than your head is. So pay attention to your body when you're playing and feel time. And when you have confirmation from a metronome or a drum machine or a track that you're in the pocket, take a picture of that. Feel that and try to recall that when you play. Okay, so it's a, it's, you know, we, we learn these things in phases. And learning to follow is a challenge in itself, but it doesn't really get us to where we want to go. Right. You know? And I would rather hear people really owning it and maybe speeding up and slowing down, you know, the time is ebbing and flowing. Some of the greatest recordings are all over the place that way, but they're, oh my gosh, they're played with so much soul and heart and passion and communication that they work wonderfully. So to me, it's more important to be able to, to play the time with conviction than it is to play, you know, chase something and be, <laughs> on average, perfect. Right? You know? Well, we rushed and then we dragged and we rushed and we dragged and we rushed and we dragged and I have to be perfect. <laughs> All right, I think we're out of time. Any last minute quick questions or comments? <laughs> <laughs> I did too. I did too. Let's keep going. Thank you, guys. That was a blast.